Welcome to Modern Aikidoist Podcast. My sincere thanks to the listeners who have liked, subscribed, and commented. Your interest is noticed and deeply appreciated. The question today comes from a listener. Why is Aikido so misunderstood? Thank you, Carlos, for the suggestion, and I'm glad to get into this today. There are a few factors which I think account for why Aikido is misunderstood and why there are so many disagreements about it. Aikido is viewed in such drastically different ways that practitioners even argue about the fundamental nature of what Aikido is. Some believe it is not a martial art at all, while others, including myself, believe it is. Let's get into the subject and I'll explain my perspective on it. First off, Aikido as it is recognized today is a relatively new art. The founder, Morohai Ueshiba, referred to as Osensei, which means great teacher in Japanese, created it from a number of different martial arts which dated back prior to the 20th century. The primary influence for Aikido was Daitoru Aikijujitsu. The Daitoru curriculum was quite vast, and Ueshiba eliminated some of the techniques to create Aikido. Using the term create is not necessarily accurate. It would probably be more accurate to say that he collected techniques into a curriculum which is now recognized as Aikido. I'm quite certain the collection of techniques and approaches were quite unique to Osensei himself. However, that's merely my guess. As far as I know, he did not describe in detail why he chose the techniques he did or abandoned others. He left no clear criteria by which one could tell whether a technique could be measured to fit within Aikido or not. In fact, quite the opposite is true. In Morahai's own words, quote, The techniques of Aikido change constantly. Every encounter is unique and the appropriate response should be emerge naturally. Today's techniques will be different tomorrow. Do not get caught up with the form and appearance of a challenge. Aikido has no form. It is the study of the spirit, unquote. I should point out here that Morahai did not speak English, so these words were translated into English from the Japanese, and there may be some, some message that was lost a little bit in translation, but for the most part, his meaning seems to be pretty clear. These statements strongly suggest that Aikido is not merely a collection of techniques, but some mixture of techniques, tactics, strategy, and even philosophy. I'll get more into the topic of Osensei's writings and the translations of them in a bit. Oftentimes, when an extraordinary martial artist creates a style or an art, his or her system is quite pure. That purity comes from the clarity of their vision. The techniques and methods that the founder assembles are highly effective and he understands how they fit together. The founder takes on students who are taught that style or art under the founder's supervision. If the students are taught well and the understanding of what makes that style or art powerful is passed along, then the students are competent and capable with that system. To use a more modern term, the results are repeatable. The better an art or system is designed, the easier it is to teach and have students perform it well, without needing extraordinary talent or athleticism in order to succeed. Osensei had a number of students who had superb reputations for being potent martial artists and splendid examples of the power of Aikido. Here is where we need to face reality, which is more complex than what we are often led to believe. First off, many of Osensei's students came to him as highly experienced martial artists already. Quite a few of them were high-ranking judo practitioners when they started their Aikido training. This means they were very physically capable and had a high level of understanding of balance, leverage, and movement, and were also well experienced in direct martial competition. This meant that they had the experienced eye to watch Osensei demonstrate technique and figure out how to emulate it. This was necessary be because by all accounts of those who attended Osensei's classes, he was a poor teacher, at least by modern standards. The Japanese teaching model of that era was pretty much watch and learn and then do a lot of repetitions until you figure it out. Bear with me here because what I'm going to cover is what I believe is the most likely reasons behind the misunderstandings about Aikido. Osensei would demonstrate a technique, sometimes only once or twice, and then tell people to practice. He would provide no description of what he was showing, as is commonplace in dojos today. I've heard that when he demonstrated, he would often not even demonstrate the same technique twice in a row. He might show one technique, and then the next time show a different one, and merely say, practice. This meant if you did not have a very sharp eye to catch what he did the first time, you were on your own figuring out what you should be doing. I believe had his students not already been extremely experienced martial artists, they would have been so confused that they would not have achieved a high level of proficiency at all. Still, these were not the most confusing things Osensei did as a teacher. There is almost unanimous agreement by those who attended Osensei's classes that he would launch into long speeches which were virtually incoherent. Osensei was a very religious man and would talk of spirituality and religion at length. 
Many students commented that they had no clue what he was talking about and were rather impatient for these speeches to end so that they could get back to training. Keep in mind that these were mostly native Japanese-speaking people, so poor translation was not the issue. Even among native speakers, Osensei's speeches were very confusing. This means that between the founder and his students, there was a lack of clarity about what Akita was exactly. It didn't take two or three generations of students to create disagreements about it. It happened with the first generation. A number of those students disagreed strongly enough that many split off to create their own organizations. Most notably, Koichi Tohei, who was the chief instructor at the Aikikai while Osensei was still alive. Tohei resigned a few years after Osensei's passing due to disagreements with the Doshu, Osensei's son Kisumaru. Even when Osensei was still alive, he disagreed with Toei about how to teach Aikido, but still kept him as chief instructor of Hambu, or headquarter dojo of the Aikikai. Osensei also pleaded with Tohei to accept 10th Dan, 10th degree black belt, just prior to his death, which to- Tohei accepted. Clearly, there were differences between Osensei's vision and Tohei's, but Osensei still strongly endorsed him. So, what was Osensei's vision exactly? It's impossible to tell for a number of reasons. First, whether it was his speeches or his writings, they made little sense to even native Japanese speakers. Second is that the translations from Japanese to English or other languages is very difficult and often inaccurate, creating vast misunderstandings about the true meaning. Several attempts have been made to translate Osensei's writings and all conflict with one another with no indication which is the closest to the original intent. Third, Those writings have been edited by others, which means their meaning is further distorted. It is for these reasons that I believe they cannot be relied on to build an accurate understanding of Osensei's vision. There's a fantastic article on these aspects of Osensei's writings and message that I will leave in the link in the description area. Given that Osensei was very unclear about his meaning, although it may have made sense in his own mind, we cannot use such distorted sources to claim a solid understanding. There just isn't enough clear and tangible evidence to reconstruct his true meaning with any reasonable accuracy. That doesn't mean people haven't tried, because they certainly have. Some have claimed and will passionately argue that they know exactly what Osensei meant and are insistent that they are correct about their interpretation of his messages. These people are usually the ones interested primarily in the spiritual or philosophical aspect of Aikido, and base their beliefs solely on Osensei's writings. Quotes like Aikido reconciling the world and making humans one family, calling Aikido the art of peace, and being in harmony with the universe are some of the statements which create the basis for such interpretations. If you rely solely on Osensei's writings and overlook the rather glaring problem of translation or editing issues, then one could come to believe that Osensei was a pacifist. Osensei's own son, Kishimaru, flatly denied his father was ever a pacifist when asked about it in an interview. How could that be so when compared to his quotes? We will likely never know his true attitudes because he was so difficult to understand, but I think that it is clear that the idea he was a pacifist lacks credibility. As you can see, there's plenty of room for misunderstanding. Osensei was a complex man who, like many of us, has many sides. He was extremely spiritual, religious, and had a strong philosophical side. He was also a war veteran who probably saw the ugliest side of human behavior. There were also accounts that call into question his sanity. For example, he would walk around and have conversations with his dead ancestors, or so he claimed. Can one really make sense of someone who shows signs of potential mental illness? We cannot say for sure, but I believe this is another reason to question any interpretation of his meaning. In the end, it seems there are three main camps of Aikido practitioners out there, and each is distinctly different. One group is the pacifist types who are drawn into the philosophical and spiritual aspects of Aikido. These are people who tend to make the case that Aikido is something more than a martial art, even to the point that it's not a martial art at all. The second, practitioners who love the details of the physical art with some level of interest in the spiritual and philosophical aspects. They tend to dig deep into the details of technique, more for its own sake than having it be practical. And third, Practitioners who study Aikido as an effective and potent martial art which is capable for self-defense. This group seems to be smaller than either of the other two, but it seems like that's growing these days. It is just my opinion, but based on accounts of Osensei and his primary students accepting challenges and proving Aikido's capabilities, I think the third group is far closer to Osensei's Aikido than the first two groups. These groups are at odds with one another to one degree or other. 
sometimes to a drastic degree, most notably between the pacifist and the self-defense groups. The reason being that they are two fundamentally different views of Aikido and Aikido's heritage. It took me some time within the Aikido community to understand these perspectives, and I'm still trying to learn more. It makes sense why outsiders are confused about what Aikido is because Aikido practitioners cannot even agree on what it is. Great misunderstandings are created by inconsistent explanations and descriptions. Usually when somebody asks about a particular martial art, they don't find vague and confusing answers very satisfying. I've seen Aikido practitioners of 15 to 20 years or more experience not be able to clearly answer the question, what is Aikido? That's an image and marketing problem and I think is a great deal to do with Aikido's declining popularity, but that's another topic altogether. What are other topics you're interested in hearing covered in this podcast? Please share your ideas in the comments if you're watching this on YouTube. You can also go to the Facebook group Aikido the Marshall Side and post a comment. Your input and engagement helps podcasts like these stay around. Please support it by liking, subscribing, and sharing. Enjoy your training!